This is the 2021 14-inch MacBook Pro, Apple's first redesigned MacBook Pro in five years. It's got some massive gains in weight, size, and functionality. I've had this laptop since launch, and we're here to talk about this laptop and see if it's worth it for you. Let's get started with a little review. This video is sponsored by Clean My Mac X. You know what I hate seeing on my Macs? This thing. It's what Wikipedia aptly calls the spinning beach ball of death, but that's also where Clean My Mac X comes into play. Clean My Mac X is a macOS software that has over 30 different tools to help you optimize, organize, and clean your Mac all consolidated into a singular app with a clean looking UI to help keep your Mac in tip top shape. For example, the tool SmartScan scans your system for log files and user cache data that your system no longer needs, as well as checks for malware and runs optimization tasks to help speed up your Mac. SpaceLens shows all the files that are taking up so much space on your Mac so that you can find and delete all the ones that you don't need. Because honestly, who needs 10 copies of that really cool 8K video you downloaded? You definitely don't. You need just one. So. Stop wasting space. Optimization lets you control how much of your Mac's resources are being used by different applications, and malware removal scans your Mac for potential viruses, adware, and background cryptocurrency miners, and helps get rid of them for you. Check out all those tools and more with Clean My Mac X with the link in the video description below and get your Mac cleaned up, functioning better, and feeling newer. Anyway, back to the video. The model that I have right here is the base model $2,000 14-inch MacBook Pro. So when I talk about performance of the device, it will be based on that machine. Timestamps in different sections will be in the description, just in case you wanted to know more about specific topics. Anyway, let's start. When you hold the MacBook Pro in your hand, the first thing you'll notice is how much heavier they are than the outgoing model. This thing feels weighty, but still light enough to hold with one hand. The 14-inch MacBook Pro is bigger than the previous 13-inch MacBook Pros in both screen size and body. So if you're a previous MacBook Pro 13-inch owner, your old accessories for the laptop, like cases and laptop sleeves, might not be useful anymore. Overall, the device is boxier with significantly more ports. It has a MagSafe 3 port, two USB 4 ports, and a headphone jack all on the left side of the machine, and on the right side, it has an HDMI port, a USB 4 port, and an SD card slot. The lid has the usual Apple logo, but this time, the Apple logo is actually a little bigger than before and the lid itself is now flat. Perfect for using your new shiny $2,000 laptop as a mouse pad, food tray, or to play with your Pokemon cards. If you flip it over, the bottom side now has in big engraved letters, MacBook Pro spelled out. I think it's an interesting design choice, but personally, I'm kind of neutral on it. It looks fine with or without it. The bottom feet are also now flat pads. There are two vents on the sides and a vent on the top that are large enough for small food particles to enter accidentally. But I'm going to assume most people wouldn't be eating food off the back of the machine. You'd most likely be eating on top of it, like we established earlier. When you open the laptop, you can still open it with just a single finger, thanks to the indent on the bottom, and the hinge feels as smooth as older Apple laptops. Moving on to the display, the display is bigger, it has smaller bezels, and there's now this notch, similar to the iPhones, but unlike the iPhone, it doesn't have Face ID, and there is an updated 1080p webcam, which I personally think looks better than their old 720p one. However, it doesn't have the center stage feature, which comes on their iPads, that allow you to kind of move around and watch the camera follow you, so you're always on display. And while we're at it, this is how the mics on the MacBook Pro sounds, and also the angle that you're most likely to use this webcam at. The mouse cursor goes behind the notch, and if your app has enough options to take up the entire menu bar up top, it will be unseeable because it's behind the notch. But other than that instance, I rarely notice the notch at all, really. The keyboard replaces the old shorter function rows with full-size keys, and Apple got rid of the touch bar altogether from the 14-inch and 16-inch MacBook Pros. The backlit keyboard also has this new black backing, and the scissor switches on the keyboard itself is a decent typing experience, and I have no issues typing things up for long periods of time. Like for example, the script of this video. The trackpad is massive, enough to fit a grown man's fist inside, and is still a force touch trackpad, meaning you can press down anywhere in the trackpad and it's an even click throughout. All right, enough about the physical features of the device. Now let's talk about my personal experiences with it over the last month. The laptop honestly feels like it lasts forever. I charge it maybe every three or four days. And that's because these Apple Silicon Macs are really good at sipping minimal power when they're in sleep mode. 
And while the MagSafe port is dedicated to charging, you can still charge the laptop via USB-C. So instead of having just one port to charge, you technically have four different ports to choose from. The MagSafe charger is probably the ideal one, since if your cable gets snagged, it just disconnects the cable instead of pulling the entire laptop with it, like it does with USB Type-C. I do want to note though, that because the SD card slot and the USB 4 port on the right side are so close to each other, and so similar in height, you might try to plug something into the USB 4 port, but instead accidentally jam your cable directly into the SD card slot, where it clearly does not belong. It's happened to me, and I guess, well, a little bit of advice, don't be me. The speakers on this device is great, and definitely not what you expect out of a laptop at all. Here's some music to show you what I mean. When doing everyday casual things like email, writing documents, and watching videos and movies, the laptop stays cold. It doesn't get warm, it stays cold. And it really only starts to warm up when you're charging the laptop, have a bunch of tabs open, you're connected to multiple monitors, or downloading multiple files or video editing. There's only been a handful of times I've heard the laptop get hot and the fans start ramping up like crazy. And that's when I was charging the laptop and exporting a video at the same time, and when I was testing some games. The fan is audible, but not super loud. I will say though, when the fans are running at full speed, it's not comfortable to keep the laptop on your lap for long periods of time because you can definitely feel the heat being pushed out from the sides and the bottom panel of the laptop. The M1 Pro chip in the MacBook is fantastic. Everything feels smooth and starts up quickly. This also applied to the original M1 as well. That chip already made Apple's less expensive laptops feel super smooth. But this MacBook Pro with the M1 Pro and 120 Hz display takes it to a whole new level. Personally, I think 120 Hz is a nice to have, but not necessarily a game changer. And 60 Hz is Good enough, right? But 120 Hertz definitely makes things feel even smoother than before. The mini LED display is a nice upgrade, but honestly, in most of my everyday usage, I feel like it didn't make a significant difference. Watching video content on the laptop is of course more immersive now because of it, but on the higher brightnesses, the halo glow of bright objects on dark backgrounds get more and more apparent. Performance of the MacBook Pro is great, I ran into no issues with video editing multiple streams of 4K footage in Final Cut Pro, letting me see every booger and strand of gray hair on my head, and exporting video with the MacBook Pro is just stupid fast. My last video on the Pixel 6 Pro was 9 minutes and 55 seconds long, so roughly 10 minutes, right? And getting that ProRes 422 LT timeline exported and encoded in .264 for upload onto YouTube only took the 14-inch MacBook Pro 10 minutes and 35 seconds. I know that was very technical sounding, but what I'm trying to say is the MacBook Pro only gets slightly warm from that and got the video exported in a great time. Editing 24 megapixel photos in Affinity for my YouTube thumbnails was also smooth. There were no hitches there. Plugging in two external 4K monitors was absolutely no problem for it, and it never started once during it. The MacBook Pro also does okay on gaming. On everyone's favorite Mac gaming benchmark, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, it ran low settings at 720p and averaged 95 frames per second. On high settings at 1920p, it averaged 48 FPS. Obviously, that isn't a perfect benchmark since the game was written for Intel Macs, so there is a performance hit, but honestly, there aren't many, if any, AAA games created for Apple Silicon Macs yet. So currently, if you plan to use your MacBook Pro to play games, or well, play games on any Apple Silicon Mac, you're gonna have to jump through a few hoops, like using the built-in Rosetta 2 translation, or using software like Parallels to emulate Windows 10 for ARM, which would then emulate x86 to play Windows games. Either way, it's a hassle and frustrating to play the games you want on this machine. But the perks of having these Apple Silicon Macs is that they do get access to the iOS library of apps. So a decent selection of apps and games you use on your iPhone or iPad could be downloaded and used on your MacBook Pro from the App Store, but just not all of them. Keep in mind though, that these apps are normally created with a touchscreen in mind, and this laptop doesn't have a touchscreen. For example, a game like Among Us, which does work on these Macs, but probably wouldn't be your first pick to play on these. And a lot of iOS and iPadOS games don't have keyboard support and just using the trackpad for touch-based games isn't the best experience. 
Beyond that, I think performance is excellent everywhere else. Last year, when Apple started releasing Apple Silicon Macs, I ran into some early adopter issues with the M1 MacBook Air shutting down randomly out of nowhere and Final Cut having audio issues. Those issues did go away over the time that I owned the M1 MacBook Air, but I'll just say that I had some really weird software glitches with this new 14 inch MacBook Pro as well. But it's just two really strange ones related to Final Cut Pro. So maybe this is more of a Jimmy problem than a general 14 inch MacBook Pro owner problem. When I'm connected to two external monitors, Final Cut Pro randomly just locks up and I can't close the window. This happens randomly while I'm editing and is annoying because I'd have to force close Final Cut Pro and open it up occasionally. The second one is when I worked on a Final Cut Pro project on a different M1 machine, then tried to export it on this MacBook Pro, this M1 Pro MacBook Pro, the export was continuously failing. I've worked on the same projects on multiple Macs before, a mixture between Intel and M1 at some point, and it's never done this. But based on my own experiences, I've only had issues with Final Cut Pro playing nice with the M1 Pro. But everything else, like the OS, seems to be functioning just as intended. So, small request from me, if you happen to have an M1 Pro or even an M1 Max machine, feel free to leave in the comment section what early adopter issues you're personally experiencing that I haven't mentioned, that I haven't experienced. I'd be interested to know, and I'm pretty sure it'd be helpful for everyone watching this video, and they'd like to hear it too. Okay, so I guess it's conclusion time, right? Should you get the 14 inch MacBook Pro? Obviously the answer always ends up at, it depends. But think about this for a second, okay? If you're a student doing assignments, like having PDFs, Word documents, spreadsheets, and Spotify going on in the background, or if you just use your computer for simple tasks like emails, getting into video editing or photography, or maybe even just printing documents, then I really think you should look at the M1 MacBook Air instead. That machine provides tremendous value for half the price of this laptop. I mean, you can fit in the price of an iPad Pro with the MacBook Air and still get under the price of one of these M1 Pro MacBook Pros. The M1 chip in the MacBook Air is still really, really good. And it's what I used to edit all my videos before I bought the 14 inch MacBook Pro. But if you're someone who needs the extra power and do things professionally, like say you're an app developer or a pro videographer or a pro photographer or whatever pro field you're in that needs a lot of computing power, I think this is a great fit. It does everything I need it to do and more, and I can definitely see this machine lasting me a long time before I need to upgrade. It has every port I need, has great speakers, a smooth and crisp 120 hertz mini LED display, fantastic performance, and battery life on it is great. I think this is my go-to Mac recommendation for people who use their laptops to create things or need a laptop with even better performance than the already fantastic M1 Max, while still keeping the great battery life. It's Apple's most pro laptop in a long time, and I'm honestly excited to see what other Apple Silicon products are in the horizon. Anyway, what do you personally think? Why does the 14 inch MacBook Pro interest you? What other laptops do you have on your potential list? What do you dislike about this laptop? What shocked you about it? Leave all that in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and well, don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you all next time. Bye.